Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Thanks for joining me today. While you're here, please make sure to like and subscribe. My name is Judy Cho and I'm board certified in holistic nutrition. And I have a private practice where we focus on root cause healing. And it often starts with a carnivore cures all meat elimination diet. Today, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Dr. Lysander Jim. Dr. Lysander is a chronic illness expert and treats lots of chronic illness, especially from the environment, such as SIRS, possibly Lyme and MCAS. But he also is a master specialist in chronic back pain. Dr. Lysander recently released this book called Specific Spine. And if you look in here, it's really cool, but he has all these images and graphics of different positions and ways to actually heal chronic back pain and getting to the root cause of healing. I love this conversation because he shares so many tactical ways to understand why we have chronic back pain and how we can finally alleviate it to get to real true root cause healing. And he's also super honest where he shares a lot about where some people may actually need a little bit of surgery. Dr. Lysander Jim is a board certified physical medicine and rehabilitation doctor. He graduated from the University of California, Berkeley, go bears with a degree in psychology. And he has his medical doctorate at the Albert Einstein college of medicine. And Dr. Jim completed his residency in physical medicine and rehabilitation at the veteran affairs hospital at UCLA. Dr. Jim is renowned for his treatment of chronic fatigue syndrome and other immunological conditions arising from environmental illness. Dr. Jim works as a medical legal expert in mold litigation, and he is the founder of Mastery Medical, where he focuses on chronic environmental illness and chronic spine pain. I never knew much about chronic back pain, but I hear about it a lot from my clients and patients. So many people suffer from back pain. And in this conversation, Dr. Jim shares so much nuance about how to support back pain and how maybe not just our posture, but the amount of movement is affecting our ability for our backs to forever heal and not just suffer from chronic back pain. I know you'll find this conversation as useful as I did. Let's get right into the interview. Hi, Dr. Lysander. I'm super excited to have you on and talk about all things back pain. You know, for as long as I've had my channel, I've never had somebody come on and talk about back pain, but it's such a chronic illness in people. So, you know, for the people that are listening and watching, if you can introduce yourself. Oh, thank you, Judy. No, this is a real treat and I'm so glad to be here. Yeah, I would say my background is I'm a, a spine doctor and an environmental medicine doctor. And I know we were able to connect through our kind of work together in the Sears community. And I, I've been treating back pain for over 10 years now. And I would say I've been effectively treating back pain for about seven of those 10 years. So my journey into becoming a spine specialist started when in my training in physical medicine and rehabilitation, we're sort of like the sports medicine type doctors that people see. We, some of us do injections, I didn't, none of us do operations. So we're kind of like supposed to be the guide for the intractable cases of back pain and joint injury that people can't recover from. And so when I finished my training, I was a pain medicine doctor and that entailed prescribing various painkillers, but most importantly, we were kind of the escape mechanism. If, if you had a patient who was complaining about their pain too much and you just didn't have the bandwidth or didn't have the expertise, go to the pain clinic. And so we kind of served that mechanism and we were the ones who prescribed opioids, which were you know highly regulated, highly dangerous. So either these experts wouldn't, uh, other doctors wouldn't want to prescribe those medications or there's, uh, they didn't have the expertise and it fell upon us. So I think within six months to a year of starting that job, I was completely burnt out because I saw the same patients suffering month after month. And it seems like there was no tool that would help them. You could say physical therapy, they've done 10 rounds, they've done multiple rounds of injections. Some of them had surgeries, sometimes multiple fell back surgeries. And those were the sickest, most chronically suffering patients. And so what, um, so I used to actually dread seeing back pain patients the most because I felt I understood their condition the least they were suffering and they were suffering the most. It was a, a very horrible combination for them and for me as a professional. Well, that started to change one day when I got a call from a sports medicine doctor. His name was Dr. Jert Sipin. 
And he said, the way your kind of practice, I mean, I was working for somebody, but the way your practice is treating back pain is all wrong. You prescribe dangerous medications. You send them for injections that don't really work. Your therapy doesn't seem to work. And then you just refer them out to surgery. And when the surgery fails, they get bounced back to you. And so I like to pride myself on being a humble person. And I was actually very burnt out when he told me this, you know, one day in December. And I said, I completely agree with you, but this is kind of the standard of care that we're administering. And if you know a better way, please let me know. And that's when he told me about a textbook called Low Back Disorders. It was written by a Canadian professor named uh, Dr. Stuart McGill. And Dr. McGill has his own kind of fascinating journey we can go into, but he basically started off as a professor and he was studying mechanisms in people and in kind of a in vitro lab where he would get uh, pig spines. So the, these pig necks apparently are kind of a good analogy or, or simile to human spines. So he would test them in the in vitro clinic, he would test people. And as he worked with different medical societies, the doctors he worked with would say, hey, you're understanding the spine at a level that is kind of beyond what we're doing. You're bringing these mechanisms into the clinic. Why don't you see some patients with us? And then, so he would say, well, I'm not really a clinician. And then, so, but then gradually he, he kind of entered that and through bringing the science and his working with certain um, elite clinicians, he became arguably the best spine clinician in the world, <laughs> a professor of spine biomechanics. And so he incorporated ideas from not just the bio, um, biomechanics, but also from psychology, from the performance domains and radiology. He integrated all of these different concepts into one system, which is today known as the McGill method. And his book, when I remember starting low back disorders, it was the first two chapters were about the limitations of modern healthcare, specifically as it pertained to the spine. And I, I felt like it was speaking to me directly. Everything I hated about my job, this textbook was saying the limited time, the lack of physical examination, the lack of corresponding a patient's true condition to the MRI. He said, Professor McGill said, what the doctors are doing, and I can attest to this as a doctor and what someone who knows a lot of doctors, they're basically taking the MRI and saying, whatever's wrong with the MRI is the problem with you. And that can work some of the times, but it fails much of the times because for there's many reasons, but one reason is you can have a pain that the MRI can't pick up. So then if your pain's invisible to the MRI, that's a problem. Two is some of our patients come in and they have five, 10 conditions you can list on the MRI. And then not all of them are necessarily a pain generator. Some of them maybe are healed prior injuries. Some of these injuries don't become clinical necessarily. So if you're simply treating, what usually happens to a patient is they're simply getting treated with what's ugliest on the MRI. And so they might get a fusion somewhere where they don't need a fusion. And this happens quite frequently is most doctors are not getting a clinical diagnosis they're basically figuratively or literally copying and pasting that radiology impression onto the report. And, and the most challenging spine joint condition, let's say, to treat and fix is, um, is chronic back pain. I, I referred it to once as it's kind of like the dragon of all joint injuries. So if I'm understanding you right, then if I went to a standard back pain doctor and it said my back hurt, and then they did an MRI and then based regardless of what I'm saying and where it hurts and all the symptoms, they're going to go more off of the test result and say, this is your condition. Here's what you need to do. And not as much of my symptomology. Exactly. The symptoms will guide some clinicians and, you know, I have to emphasize, of course, there's a range in terms of the quality, but the standard of care, uh, you know, people fly out of states for a spine consultation as far as Hawaii and Alaska for, I wouldn't say simple problems because many problems are not as simple as they seem, but for a disc bulge, which is the most common type of disc injury. And what you just stated, Judy, is exactly what happens. Most people go to a primary care doctor for as the initial doctor to see for back pain. So let's say you're moving some heavy furniture, your back hurts, you get an x-ray, you usually won't even get an MRI at first. They're really just looking at that and then 
the reports almost always say the same thing. No acute osseous injury, which means, well, you didn't break your back lifting this furniture. Maybe you kind of struggle along for a few months, your back pain. Most of back pain goes away. So that's kind of the blessing. Most back pain resolves within six weeks, three months. But when it doesn't, then uh, the symptomatology talked about kind of subtle clues from the physical exam. That's what's going to guide you to what some people refer to as the injury mechanism or the functional diagnosis. But then if you're not doing all of that kind of clinical thinking, which is really a, a, a clinical thing, not a radiographic thing, then you can't necessarily make sense of what's happening on the spinal imaging. So let me take a step back and then talk about, so what exactly is back pain? And then if maybe you can explain, and then we'll eventually get to, so what's the best way to get care? But. Understood. So the what is back pain? I would say back pain is really just pain occurring really anywhere on the kind of so-called dorsum or back of the body. And then specifically what we focus on is low back pain. Mm -hmm. And that region is usually marked by kind of the bottom of the ribs, kind of all the way down to the um, top of the buttock area. Okay. And then what is non-specific back pain? Non-specific back pain is a, a standardized medical term and also a research term to refer to a physical injury to your back that has no known cause, according to your practitioner. Non-specific back pain is the diagnosis that is used in about 85% of cases of low back pain. So, so basically, it's a way of saying a kind of a... Um, a technical way of saying is, well, we know there's something wrong with your back, but we don't really know the specific anatomy or injury mechanism that's occurring. Oh, I see that a lot with my uh, clientele that has an undiagnosable autoimmune. They don't know why it happened, but they know yes. there's some level of antibodies and they don't have a specific reason, but I didn't realize yes, that's they... an excellent analogy. <laughs> I see that. And what I do appreciate about both of these terms though, is at least it, it, it's, at least it's in the right ballpark. Mm -hmm. At least it's not patient blaming, it's not gaslighting, it's not saying that it's some other region. But then, so I, I kind of like the honesty of the, hey, we don't really know what's going on. But if you're, if you stay there, then that's purgatory. Because if we don't know the causes in either of those instances, then you can't really create a individualized treatment plan. Okay. And then what about chronic back pain? And then, and especially lower back pain? And then something like the, a disc, a herniated disc, is that the same thing? Is a herniated disc more specific? Yeah, so a, a, we'll start from the most general, which is a chronic back pain. There's some varying definitions, but usually chronic back pain would be back pain that either have constantly or even kind of intermittently, which is kind of the nature of a lot of back pain for more than of a period of three to six months. So it doesn't necessarily refer to severity. Some are mild, some are disabling, but it just kind of had that kind of chronicity, that long-termness. And then what was that middle term? You said chronic back pain. There was a-, a um, I said lower back pain. And then- and lower back pain. And lower back pain refers to that pain that is in that region that was below the ribs and above the okay. buttocks or from damage arising from one of those, when a, uh, from a spine problem in that area. So the most common example being sciatica. The pain could be in the glute, it could be down the leg, but because it's arising from, let's say, a disc bulge or disc herniation, then, then it's still considered back pain, even though some patients say, actually, I actually have zero pain in my back, it's all in my glute or it's all in my leg. And kind of moving on to that last term you talked about, a disc herniation is a particular type of disc bulge. And kind of the analogy is, if you think about the disc, it looks like a hockey puck. So it's this kind of roundish material. And then the outer wall is, has, there's like this outer wall um, around it. And then within that outer wall, there's this kind of jelly-like center. So a herniated disc means that the jelly has burst through kind of the walls and it's, and then it can be painful because it can um, press onto a nerve or it can also affect inflame the nerve because it causes a inflammatory reaction when it kind of gets out of the containment. And then why does, I mean, I feel like chronic pain is so common, especially in the back. So why does that happen? Why does that happen even with the discs? Disc injury is in most cases, a cumulative process. It's sort of like with heart disease, how they say the first symptom of most people's heart disease is sudden death. Mm -hmm. And then, so what does that mean in that case? Well, it means that you can develop 
injury and damage for years and decades before it manifests into something that you actually feel that's of consequence. And so there's this whole period that's silent. Some people say it's a silent period or a subclinical period that could be building for years or decades. And so if you think about what are the factors that injure our, our discs, there's three main things that injure the disc. So actually I have here for illustrations, I don't know if you, I'm sure you've used these growing up. It's a high polymer Pentel eraser. So this is kind of like the fancier eraser. So I'm just gonna remove the sleeve. And this is say the disc is the spacer that's between the bones. So let's say this is the, um, the disc. So the very same factors that would destroy this eraser before its time are the same factors that would destroy a disc. So let's be more specific. So number one, if I just kept bending this eraser back and forth over and over, it's going to eventually wear down the, the fabric or the, the material, the polymer within it. That's one way to destroy it. So bending, or I could even say twisting it is pretty bad too. Number two is if I bent this eraser as far as it could go in, in the, the back pain, what we call that in range bending, I'm going to bend forward as much as I can for a yoga pose, or I'm going to arch the other way as far. That's going to also, you can imagine tear this and it's going to damage your disc. But the best way to destroy this eraser fast is actually to combine two pressures. So if I actually can compress it, so if I could push it down from the sides first, no problem, right? It can be very strong in this position. But if I keep pressing it and then I bend it, then this will crack. So then that's the most, so that would be called, that would be like what would happen if you had, I don't know, 200 pounds on your back for a back squat, you're descending and at the bottom, your spine bent a little bit under all that load. That would be this pressure, which is fine. But with that little bit of bend, you could tear it without that bending it all too far. So those are the three main factors that cumulative wear down your disc and then cause an injury at the end. So I think most people, and thank you for that. That was a very easily way to understand that. But I think the average person doesn't lift that much. I mean, I know there are some people that do, but so in a day-to-day, -day, the average person, what causes a lot of the disc injury then? Is it our posture? Is it we're sitting weird? We're picking up stuff weird? It's a combination of, I would say two to three things. One is like we are now, our, um, our position is very sedentary. So we're kind of sitting, we're sitting around in our cars, in our offices all day. So that creates a, a um, kind of a constant stress onto the disc that it doesn't like. The disc, like our muscles and joints, it actually likes movement and variety. And then when you kind of create the same pressure on a disc for a long time with just being sedentary, then you can easily overwhelm the disc. It's not, um, the outside of the disc has sometimes been compared that outside wall to a fabric. So it's just like, you know, maybe like the sweater you're wearing. Some people don't hang their sweaters up because they say, well, if I hang my sweater up too long, the fabric's gonna kind of loosen up at right. the shoulders. So that effect happens at the disc too in its own way. If you just create a constant static load on it. The other thing is there's two basic movement errors that people have. And some, most people are a mix of those two. So the first basic error is some people are kind of flexed and rounded all of the time. So let's say I'm sitting at this desk, my spine is actually a little bit rounded right now. I'm gonna exaggerate that. So okay. that forward bend, people call it flexion. So imagine I get out of bed, you know, I kind of bend my spine to make the bed. I go wash my face. I sit in a car to work. Then I'm sitting all day in front of a computer, which kind of exaggerates that flexion. So now you're not only creating that spend, you're actually bending the spine a little bit. You're bending the disc all day long. And so when you bend the disc, you're, when you bend forward, let's say this is the forward direction. If I compress this part, it's going to actually create more pressure in the back away from it. So then, so then that's why, why do most people get posterior disc bulges? It's because there's a, a lot of pressure on unusual pressure on one part of the spine. So we're usually not kind of stacked and neutral. We're kind of creating pressure one side. And if there's that kind of gel in the inside, it's going to shift to the back. And when you bend forward, it also strains, it kind of stretches the fibers on the back here too. The other common er um, error is the overcorrection of that, which is called extension. So I'll sit in extension now just to, just to kind of illustrate. You see, I'm kind of pulled my shoulders back and then I'm kind of it looks a little bit more presentable, but it still looks kind of odd. Um, but I mean, if you're going to 
if you could present yourself one way, what I think this probably looks better than sitting like this, but then what people don't realize is your spine actually gets loaded in either direction. Mm -hmm. It likes to be in the sweet spot. Some people call it the sweet zone, the neutral, the elastic equilibrium. But the characteristic that that has is it kind of creates a load in a way that is most sustainable for the spine. It's where the ligaments are not really stretched. And I know, um, you know, like if you ever heard of any jujitsu players, what are the jujitsu players doing to each other? They're taking the joint to an unhappy place. So you can actually, you can injure my arm by bending it, hyperflexing it, or you can arm bar me and straighten my arm out. But I would say, I would say some people, they're kind of doing that a little bit to a lower degree on themselves all day. Like some of the people, they stand like this, they sit like this, and then they think, well, my posture is great. I don't, you know, I don't know what posture has to do with it. And when you correct them into this kind of square posture, they say, I feel like I'm so slouchy right now. Yeah. You know, their, their, their mental map is completely mistuned. And, and then that comes from conditioning. Like I know, like some people would say, well, my parent would hit my back if I was kind of sitting slouchy. And so they would be like this all the time, or, you know, they might even, you know, there's Jordan Peterson, Jordan Peterson's book, 12 rules for life. I don't know if you've read that book before. Yeah. You, you know, remember rule number one, stand tall with your shoulders pulled back. So I think if I didn't have any expertise in biomechanics, I would just say, well, isn't that kind of like, okay, I'm tall and my shoulders are pulled back. So it's better than looking um, slouchy, but what the, one of the biggest errors people make is they don't realize this so-called arching or extension is also very stressful for the spine. So that's fascinating. So from a posture perspective, I think of also piano players, right? Where they're super straight or they look like their posture is perfect. And, yes. and then I think from Jordan Peterson's book, it's that sort of stance makes you look more domineering and no one can mess it does with you. no question. Yeah. yeah. No question. You look more domineering when you pull your shoulders back. Right, that's right. what people do when they win. Right. They, they, they pull their shoulders back, they pound their chest. And then what does the loser look like? They're kind of shrunk in the corner. You know, they don't want any attention on them. So I think that there is a connection, an intimate connection between movement and psychology. And I know Jordan Peterson's famous for his lobster analogy, how the lobster kind of just, the angry lobster, he's an extension, right? It's kind of like the arms up and then the arch. And then, but then the, the kind of all, almost across almost many, animal domains to kind of shrunken kind of, you know, dogs, cats, humans, we're, when we, when we're kind of stressed, the weight of the world is on us. We don't want anyone to look at us. It's like the kid in the back of the classroom. Like, I don't want the teacher to ask me a question. You know, they're not sitting like this. They're kind of like that. So there's this kind of connection between psychology and movement. And you can often, you probably had this, if you saw a friend or family member, you could just read their mood because, but they didn't say anything is because you're reading these kind of postural and movement cues let me ask you about the so the box because i i i understand the if i'm sitting too straight up and i know when i'm slouching so what is that fine so if the people that are listening and watching can try to just sit better what is that I box see. position so i think the kind of that's kind of square position i would say the first way i help people find it is let's say i would just say I would actually start in a standing position. So okay. I'll see if I could demonstrate this in the, so basically there's a couple, so here's, I'll just exaggerate it. So these are people who come to see me. This is the number one movement error. Their shoulders are pulled back, chest puffed okay. out. Okay. Look how extended my hips are. Okay. And you can't see my knees, but my knees, as you imagine, are completely locked out. So first thing I do is I just say, why don't you um, just pretend you're a soccer player during a free kick? So they say, okay. So then they say, well, how do they stand? And they're like, well, they kind of protect themselves, right? So now I've taken away the tension from the shoulder. I've kind of trapped their, um, their, um, them from the extension. Then I say, just let that go then. Let it go where it does. You see how I let gravity do that? I didn't use muscular force. Then I say, soften your knees. So I'm softening my knees. You saw, you can't see my knees, but you saw your hip bends automatically. So I took off extension stress. And the third step is I hover and just kind of get to that right spot where the balance is equal between my feet. Because if you try this, you're actually going to feel the weight shifting onto your heels. Okay. So I think that's kind of a one kind of cue that I use to cue people. But I think anyone who has an athletic background, um, you know, be it tennis, football, martial arts, they all have some form of what's called the ready position. Mm -hmm. So even like even a butcher has that. So the butcher was standing like that. And I said, so he's like, kind of standing like this. How do you stand in front of the butcher block? Oh, I stand like this. Everything gets kind of 
loose, I kind of tell that to the martial artists, or I recently saw a police officer and I said, imagine you're about to punch me, but then you don't want me to know you're going to punch me. So he was standing like this and he was just like, oh, he got really kind of soft and loose. And it, so that's kind of the ready position in many sports actually simulates that kind of ease because you, you just don't have dynamism in your shoulders or in your mobility if you don't have a little give to um, the knees, a little softness to the shoulders. And then there's kind of some other ways to tune the position of the pelvis because one of the biggest mistakes is people who are anterior pelvic tilt, they kind of, that's arching, right? You kind of roll your pelvis forward. And then so, um, and then that's like another way that people kind of um, create that form of stress on their body. And then is most back pain related to the disc or can there be back pain that has nothing to do with the disc area? That's a great question. And I think it's usually at some point, the problem will get to the disc. Okay. So the disc is a central hinge. So most back injury actually originates at the disc for most people. And there's a few reasons for that is when you think about the other anatomy around it, well, the disc is between two bones. It's right. it's fairly hard to injure the bones because they're so robust and stiff. And the disc has three components to it. It has that outer wall we talked about. That's called the annulus fibrosis. It has that inner gel material, which is called the nucleus propulsus. And it has like a ceiling and floor on it, which is quite fragile. It's called the end plate. So that end plate is about the thickness. It's like one millimeter. It's thinner than a credit card pretty much, but it's much, it's kind of pliable. It's part cartilage, it's part bone. And it's kind of that interface that connects the disc to the um, to the bone. So a lot of times, if you have damage to any one of these parts of the um, the disc, the most sensitive being the end plate, then that's going to alter the way it's able to build up pressure. So the pressure that builds up in your disc when you carry a load or kind of flex your muscles, which stiffens the spine, it's two to three times more than the pressure that's inside a champagne bottle. So a healthy disc can hold a ton of pressure. And if you ever open a champagne bottle, there's just such an explosive power, but it can safely hold it to a certain degree, this pressure. But once you start damaging it, in order for it to kind of have that kind of pressure buildup, all of the structures have to be working, particularly the end plates and the annulus, which form its boundaries. And so, so most of the time, injuries start as a disc injury. And then, but there's other types of injuries that happen that will affect how well the disc is able to bear load. And, and so any type of instability, the disc has to be involved because it's the main hinge. Right. So it's almost like if you have a creaky door, the hinge is somehow involved, whether someone punched the door and the door got crooked, or, you know, it just is kind of a greasy hinge or like a, a, a stiff hinge. So there it, it's either the primary outcome or the secondary outcome. And I could give you uh, some specific examples if you'd like, but I, I don't want to go too much into the weeds here. Okay. And then yeah. is that why, so from everything you're saying, I see some people that have chronic back pain, right? So like you said, it's intermittent. Sometimes there's a period they don't have back pain, but it seems like certain people just constantly get back pain. Do you think a lot of it is the posture, the way they're moving their bodies or constantly, whether they're doing, you know, the, the shoulders back or the hunched over, is it, is part of the constant perpetual injury, the posture or the way that they live life versus that they're just not properly healing or is it the same? Well, they're, they're interrelated because I think your question touches on why does chronic back pain stay chronic? Right. Why doesn't it heal like other joints? And there's really two main reasons, but the reason you pointed out is the main one. So the, the main reason most people aren't healing from their back pain is they're not being taught the correct ways to position their spine. They're not being taught the correct movement patterns. And maybe even beyond that, they're not taught kind of, they're not giving their their spine and their injury specifically the right mechanical conditions to heal. And you could tell that right away as, I mean, as a spine clinician, I could just have someone walk and sit into a chair and you could say someone has not coached this person, or maybe they have coached it, but this person doesn't because they're, they're showing some very kind of obvious movement errors. I mean, some, I mean, one example that I always think is a little bit humorous and humorous to them is the, the patient, well, you know, it could be a man or woman, but they kind of have wide hips, right? But when you see them stand, their feet are practically touching each other. Mm -hmm. Like they're not even standing with the proper base of support. And then, so then, then when they sit into a chair, you can imagine how kind of uncomfortable that is for the rest of their joints and, and their body. And so the, the key to unlocking most back pain 
is actually realizing that chronic pain is perpetuated by what's called microtrauma. These are kind of little movements and postures that are stressing, stressing the injury. So most chronic injury, I would say, of the chronic pain conditions we see of who have failed multiple providers who have been told you have no choice but surgery, well over 75% of them. The true number is probably even better than that, but I don't want to overstate it, is at least 75% of these patients, if they're given the correct diagnosis, if they understand these so-called pain triggers that worsen their injury, they actually can create the conditions for their body to heal it themselves. But if they're not given those conditions, then as you can see, it can last for years, decades, or a lifetime. I see it so hard though, too, because a lot of times I'm at my, de I'm at my desk and I don't think about how am I stand or how am I sitting? How's my posture, right? A lot of times I cross my legs and that's probably not ideal. And so how do you start training somebody to be very aware of the micro movements that is affecting their back? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I would say, well, the first part of that is what are the factors that promote healing well, you got to kind of on the average, on the whole, carry your posture and move in a way that is not offending your injury. So you don't even have to even have really pretty looking posture, but you just have to move in a way that it doesn't aggravate that. Um, Professor McGill calls it picking the scab. You give the scab some respite, it's going to heal in most cases, unless yeah, I guess it's a very deep gash or something. And then the part about sitting is a kind of a great question too. I would say sitting you know, it's okay to cross your legs sometimes. You just don't want to stay in that position. And actually that variety. So let's just say I'm going to be textbook perfect sitting. So I'm neutral spine. I'm kind of sitting like this. If I just stayed like this for the next hour, two hours, that would actually cause me back problems too, even though I'm in my neutral zone. So part of posture, usually when people say posture, they think, oh, that's when I'm still, right? When I'm standing, I'm sitting. Posture is, is, is movement too. When I'm walking, I can walk in different postures. So I think baked into that is you need variety, but you need the type of variety that doesn't upset your back. So let's just take you in one condition where I'm going to presume you have no back pain and you can get away with a lot. Our spines are meant to bend and move and sit and do all these other things to some degree. Just as with this eraser, it's meant to be erasing stuff. And it's okay when I, when I erase stuff, it's going to create some bend on it. It has the durability to really use, you can use this whole thing up. But let's say you get really aggressive on how you're racing or how you're using. And that depends on a lot of inbuilt factors like your athleticism, how thick your spine is. The thicker your spine is, the more load you can put on it, right? But then the, it also bends with a lot more strain. But if I have a very thin spine, I can bend it easily, just like a, like a thin willow branch or like a thin kind of flimsy eraser. You can bend it all day, but you just don't want to put load on it. So I think one of the keys to understanding back pain is that there's this concept called bio-individuality. We're all born with different bodies, with different tolerances and aptitudes. And if we don't respect those differences and we want to be everything, we want to be the yogi on the weekend who bends their spine to extreme ranges. And then we want to, you know, you know, barbell train. It's you're confusing your spine. You really need to kind of choose your lane. And then it's kind of like, I don't know if you read Harry Potter with your children, but there's my favorite part of that is where he's in the, the wand shop and then the owner tells him the wand chooses you. So that's kind of what happens too, is I think people get it in their heads. They can do or be anything physically, but really there's certain range of things that were adapted to. And then the people you see, you know, like some are very obvious, like it seems like most of the volleyball players are pretty tall and they're kind of mm -hmm. lanky and very mobile. But I think that that's one of the things people need to understand is they, they got to know what they are physically, what they can tolerate and kind of be sensible about how they load and train themselves too. I can see that. I mean, an exaggerated exa um, example of that would be like the Cirque du Soleil acrobats. Obviously not everyone can bend their bodies that way, but some of these people, <laughs> either they yes. learn it or force it on their bodies, yeah. but they're able to do that. And that's why they do that profession. So if we can figure out what range of motion that makes sense for us, then that would then probably yeah. be most conducive for our spine. And, and that totally yes. makes sense. So oh, now, that metaphor, by the way, is very near and dear to my heart. Oh, is it? Okay. The, the first job application I ever looked for was the Cirque du, I would say, what does it take to be in Cirque du Soleil? What? 
I saw Mysterio at Treasure Island. I don't know, I was like 10 or 12. And they have the range, right? They have the acrobats, they have the strongmen. Yeah. But then, but of course it's laughable now. You look at me, you're like, you're you're not, it's like you're not that kind of material, which is okay, you know, like you're you're um, but that's kind of the idea is that you these, I mean, those athletes get so many injuries doing what they do. And then to prolong their careers, they have to have a lot of unique factors like great shoulder mobility, hip okay. mobility. Let's say for trapeze artists. They got to have this core of steel to withstand that insane pressure of gravity pulling them. And sometimes the second person holding on to them. So they're supporting their body weight and the second person pulling on their spine when they're in the air. So they're, they're very extraordinary athletes, very inspiring. That's so funny. When I thought Cirque du Soleil, I literally just thought of those smaller people that are completely bendy, but I forgot that there's also like the heavy muscle men and stuff too, but you're right. There's yeah, that's the whole, the whole spectrum. Yeah, it actually shows the whole spectrum. And, and you could think about how laughable it is if you made them all switch their roles right, up. Right, right. Yeah. No, that's fascinating. So wh- why is it that the standard care is, I, I remember I pulled my back and now I just don't know why that happened, but it was a, just, I had a sudden jerk movement. My back started hurting. I went to the doctor and they said, oh, I think you herniated your disc. I didn't even know what that meant, but they put me on Vicodin and I took it one day and it knocked me out for 36 hours. And I said, okay, I think I'm super sensitive <laughs> to meds and I just never took any more. Yes. But ever since then, occasionally my back would hurt my lower back. Yes. It's not crazy, but I just always wondered, you know, why is it that they put medicine? Obviously that medicine was just alleviating pet pain, but it didn't fix why I even herniated my disc. And their answer was, oh, that it's very common. And I was like, okay, but yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, as someone who used to do that, it <laughs> is very common, but I would say it's not necessarily the wisest initial approach. I mean, I think what you're talking about in it's, well, there's, there's kind of like the painkiller. Do painkillers fix your back pain? In almost no case does it change your back pain. Does it help you heal faster? It doesn't reduce your need for injections. Does it reduce your need for surgery? Increase your kind of um, work rate if you're disabled from it? These medications don't, on the average, fix any of that stuff. So I think you, as somebody who likes to get at the root cause of things, think, well, why are you just treating my surface symptom and you're covering up my pain, you know, band-aid approach, if you will, um, when I just have a minor injury? And why are you starting me on this powerful and dangerous and addictive medication? You know, in your case, you got knocked out for you know 36 hours. That's unfortunately the main tool. I mean, I think a lot of medicine and spine care is really pharma driven in terms of the, the tools you have, you're basically prescribing different things from pharmaceutical companies. And remember, farm reps being there. And and then I think now it's a little bit safe to talk about how opioids are not necessarily ideal because one of the, I think one of the farm um, CEOs kind of got put in prison. And then the other ones, the Sacklers have been kind of, you know, universally pillaged for promoting this, the overuse of opioids. I think it's really just these kind of trends in medicine that have often affect the type of care people get. And the other thing I'd be remiss to point out is the quality of medical education is generally really strong. I mean, I was trained in the United States. I went to a good medical school. I went to a a good residency program, but I think that there is a kind of like a focus on certain um, modalities of treatment that are not necessarily kind of addressing that root cause that people want to get to. And I wonder how much of it is also the person. So if I have to go to you and you teach me how to just kind of sort of carry myself and what's beneficial for me versus if I were to just pop a pill and then I'm just not feeling bad, or if I just go and get a injection, that seems easier than me having to change anything about my daily mannerisms. Could that be some of it as well? Yeah. I mean, there is a culture of convenience, right? If you, I mean, I think it's much more profitable to sell benzodiazepines to relieve anxiety than to open a meditation studio. I mean, there is work that you have to do and that's impact. It's kind of a burden or a responsibility if you want to use the more positive term, but then it also is uh, not a quick fix necessarily in terms of it's about people. I mean, maybe it's analogous to nutrition. You can eat horrible and take the statin and allegedly you'll, you know, be well, or you can actually fix your diet, which takes a lot of, there's a lot of psychological and other emotional things too that affect nutrition. And I think same with movement, how, how well I'm feeling that changes how, how I move. And, and so I think that the blessing of the types of patients we get is they know it says in my intake, I'm not prescribing you opioids and for a rare occasion, I'll prescribe pain medications 
but I probably prescribed one pain, one or two pain medications non-scheduled in the last seven years. Like oh, you don't wow. really need, and I mean, it's not that none of them need these tools, but I'm saying if you really need these tools, keep that separate, see a pain medicine doctor for it. You know, as a former pain medicine doctor, I can kind of guide you into what's more sensible. But a lot of these, I mean, if we use opioids specifically, let's just say you didn't have such a horrible effect on opioids and it did help with your pain. That probably would have been worse for you long-term because opioids have what's known as paradoxical effects, which limit their effectiveness over time. One is very basic. One is tolerance. It's just like you drink one cup of coffee and after a year, maybe you need two cups to get the same fix that happens with opioids. That's called tolerance. Another one is called, uh, there's withdrawal. So if you don't get your morning coffee, you might be very irritable. That kind of happens with the opioids too. Your back actually hurts a lot more that when you're kind of in between doses. And there's even this effect called hyperalgesia where you get more sensitive to pain the longer you take opioids. This happens only to some people. And so it almost like, you're almost like in this trap door. So you're kind of darned if you don't because you're already in all this pain and you're having all these withdrawal effects. But if you keep taking it, then you kind of go into this cycle. So even if you're not necessarily even getting that euphoric high that people are kind of chasing sometimes, you can easily spiral into addiction and overdose just based on those mechanisms alone. No, and and then I always hear that maybe just standing is the answer, right? So like everyone has a standing desk nowadays and a standing treadmill, and it's just, that's the answer to fix posture and back pain. But you mentioned you have a spine book and you mentioned that it's not always just that you stand and that, you know, a lot of women, especially like to suck in, right? Their stomach and look thinner. But yes. you mentioned yes. in the book specifically, and you had some graphics, but you talk about how that's actually not good for your back. And can you sort of expand on that for me? Yeah. So the first part was standing. I mean, what do you think the Buckingham Palace guard does during his break? He's not standing, right? <laughs> he's probably sitting, he's laying down or, or more if he's very wise, he's walking around or going for a jog. So the body, it needs mechanical variety, no matter how perfectly you position yourself. If you don't give it that mechanical variety, you're going to suffer psychologically. Your muscles are going to waste away. Your spine's going to get kind of weird loading. So I think our lives are often defined by kind of restrictions in our freedom to move. Like there's people in the office environment. It's quite sad. They're afraid to use the restroom. They're like, I don't want people to see me going to the restroom, you know, two times an hour, three times an hour. So people feel very kind of constrained many of the time, much of the time. And, and so I would say, standing standing is a natural posture and it's good but if i said if i had you stand still for the next hour without moving your feet at all or go for a walk for the next hour at the end of which activity would you feel better it's the walking you know we don't want to stand in line in, in disneyland for an hour and not move so i think that those are it's it's that that movement is sometimes that missing kind of peace and understanding posture. And I think sometimes people are focused on kind of the perfect kind of position. So if they think if you stand for too long, you know what you need to do or stand and walk for too long, you need to sit, you need to lay down. So really um, the way Professor McGill puts it, which is very elegant is rest is the mechanical opposite of whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. So if I'm a construction guy, I'm moving around all day. My break is I sit in a chair. It's so fascinating because all my life, especially when I hurt my back, it was always sitting is the worst thing you could do right and it's really not just that it's sitting but is if you stay in the same position so i think of it even from the lymphs it's when we don't move our lymphs that it's just staying yep. stagnant it's actually not just the sitting it's that we're not moving or changing position so i, I think just even moving my hands is a beneficial thing i guess but that, yeah. that makes so much sense and then what about um, the sucking in or the, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. So they call it sucking in. Yeah. So it's, um, it's funny, because in my book, I think I accused women of doing it more than men. Oh, but did you? Since, I didn't see that since uh, maybe I did. I yeah. but then since then, actually, I realized men do it a whole lot. Really? And these okay. people, they're so good at doing it, men, men and women, they are so consistently sucking in their abdomen, that when I see them, I'm like, how is this person so impossibly thin, right? And then after a while, it will dawn on me because they're so consistent that throughout the entire exam, whether they're standing or sitting or lying down, it's still drawn in, it's habitual. And some of them, they even learn to breathe in a way, like there's some kind of yogic breathing traditions where you don't breathe and fill the belly and fill the diaphragm. You actually draw it in, you know, draw everything in and almost like press the air up. And then so from a spine stability and spine injury standpoint, that's 
largely uh, harmful because the you're taking a structure that has a normal size, let's say of this, and then you're taking away its resilience. If you've ever tried to crush a Coke can or something, you've finished the can, you want to recycle it. What's It's kind of hard just to crush the can. What do you do first? You squeeze the middle and crinkle it, then it's going to go down. That's what's happening to people's spine. So it's, people are taught this in yoga, Pilates, and physical therapy that you need to draw in, you need to kind of suck in. The cue they sometimes give is to selectively activate the innermost layer of the abdominal wall, which is called transverse abdominis. And so they said, so there's all these kind of really artificial ways you, you can achieve it, you can pull it in, but then it actually has a harmful kind of um, outcome for most many spine conditions. So then I'll see kids, right? And it looks like they're pushing their stomachs out. What's the right stance then? Well, I think they're pushing it out. So then one of my patients, they said he was drawing his stomach in a lot. And so I have relaxed. And he said, you mean like a bear belly? And I was like, yeah, that's a good cue. So what, what's the someone who's kind of just letting it all hang, you know, bear belly? It's, it's kind of meant to wherever you are in your kind of physical shape, you got to just let it be, you know? So it's like, if I'm on the shorter side and I'm walking around tiptoeing, I'm not doing anyone or myself any favors. And same with wherever, whatever your shape is, you gotta have, you have to accept that shape and then you have to just work within that. But then I think what a lot of people are doing is they're changing their shape to try to, you know, it's almost like Instagram filter, you know, but I could kind of do that in real life if I just suck it in all the time. And it becomes unconscious. People don't even know they're doing it and they can be, they're so, if, I mean, it, it, it amazes me because I think I don't really do that, but it takes so much energy in my mind. I feel like I wouldn't be able to do anything else if I was focused on drawing in my stomach all day. What about heels? So, you know, a lot of women wear heels. Is that bad for the spine? Yes, because for a few reasons. One is, you know, heels, you know, women wear them for, you know, probably aesthetic reasons. So one is you're not going to get a natural foot motion with a heel. So, you, you know, there's that heel sound you hear when people walk in heels. It's click, click, click. So each of those clicks is really a jolt that's just shooting up the woman's leg and into, into spine. her spine. So you're not getting those, those foot mechanics. So what load your spine sees, it really depends on how hard you're landing and whether you're able to mitigate it. So that's why our feet naturally, when you're walking barefoot, it rolls off the floor. It doesn't, you know, you would never walk like, like this. Right. So, uh, so it is harmful and I, I, I hate to be the bearer of so much uh, bad news. <laughs> No, I, I'm fine. My husband is. I know I'm going to get canceled me, so or something. I don't really wear heels, so it kind of works out for me. But <laughs> um, so then, what about heavy lifting? Do you generally not recommend? I, I'm not a big lifter anyway, so I, I don't carry that way. But you know, the, all the heavy lifting where you're lifting heavy weights from either like the floor or you're li lifting it this way. But is that generally not a good thing for your spine? Well, I would say it definitely creates a lot of patience for us, okay. people who oh, are in the okay. gym, CrossFit kind of strength training. And then, but that's not to say these people shouldn't train. It really depends a lot on your body. Okay. So I would say, let's just use barbell. Let's say, should I deadlift? This is as a specific example, should I pull from the floor? Well, one of the first things you have to consider isn't even the spine, it's your hips. Can you bend your hips far enough to reach the bar without kind of all these negative compensations like spine rounding happening? A lot of people, myself included, can't. I mean, I, I've done a little bit of, of barbell lifting. I would always have to lift from blocks because my hips just didn't allow me to do that. And then, so I think the you, I think the best way to think about it is the exercises are all a tool and then each tool has its strengths and benefits and each tool has its also weaknesses and vulnerabilities. What I would observe though is many people like me, you know, would kind of like, these kind of, you know, we're, we're really just in our normal lives, people, you know, families sitting at a desk. And then some of these people, they want to get so darn strong. And then they'll have a trainer who's progressing them week after week without any kind of breaks. And then you look at the spine and there's, you know, three end plate fractures, but that's the kind of rah, rah, kind of go get it mentality. For me, I think as a medical professional, I have to actually not create injuries in the people. And then you have to tell them things that are not that inspiring, like, you have to wind down your pain first if you want to load. And depending on the injury mechanism, some people can get back to training and other people, it's just like, yeah, you can train, but why would you choose this exercise? Like, what is your goal in getting this? And some people, they just fall in love with a particular exercise. 
And so you'll hear some people say, oh, deadlift's the best exercise. Others say no one should deadlift. The risk is too far. It depends on who you are and what your body is. But I would say for the average person like us, hey, we're, you know, we're seeing patients, you know, we're, you know, talking on a computer a lot. It's just like you want to maintain your joint health and you don't necessarily want to expose yourself to these high level exposures unless it's just your calling. Like some people, they just love it so much. I, I, I get that. So then, then you, you're willing to take certain risks. But I saw a, I think a 65 year old tennis coach. He never kind of did any of this lifting stuff. He coached, he played tennis. His spine is so beautiful. I was just kind of telling him like how beautiful his spine, like he had a pretty minor injury. And I said, just look at this. And I would just show him a 30 year old spine who had kind of been a little bit more unwittingly abusive to their spine. And then he, and then he was just like, yeah, I just never kind of got into all that other stuff. And and then there's so much pressure to be so many things. I feel like nowadays, like you got to be mobile, you got to be strong, you got to be a great parent. Like there's so many factors that are pulling, but I think people, there's really this idea of that you have to differentiate and choose a path that's based on your capability in, in your physical life too. And in the spine, it doesn't like being adapted in two different directions. It doesn't want you to be super bendy and super loading at the same time. You could be okay. in that middle zone, which is the most adaptive but you look at these, the strongest men, they're not, they're not mobile. They're kind of not that coordinated, but they're insanely strong. And you see these bendy people super coordinated, but you can't load them without injuring them. Okay. That makes sense. So would you say that what is fitting for my body is what kind of comes natural? So if I went, so I'm pretty flexible. So Pilates yoga is pretty easy for me, but lifting is just not my thing. I, I mean, I could lift, I, I, I do lift. I just lift not so heavy, but so then would I, do I just assume, okay, so maybe I'm naturally more of the bendy type people and not the lifter? What is that? Is that kind of how I figure out what is more natural for my body type? I think it's in your case, here's how I would just say, I'll just talk to you like you're a patient and I'm going to make certain assumptions. Sure, so sure. one is when you're an Asian woman, two is you're a slender Asian woman. So when I think about your long-term health, I would say, I don't want you to become osteoporotic. Right, right. I don't want you, and you're at risk for sarcopenia. So I would say you should weight train. You shouldn't just do things like swimming, which is great for a lot of different things like cardiovascular health, but you don't get that compress compressive loading in your spine. So you actually should, in your case, Lift. weight train and weight lift long term but the types of things I wouldn't put a I don't know even 45 pounds on your back though you know I would maybe have you do some curls some TRX uh, low rows I would have you do the so-called McGill big three to stabilize kind of the spine muscles and give a little bit of compression forces to the spine and uh, I would focus on movement quality I think those are some of the ways I would think through your situation and you're relatively, you know, as you say, back pain free. So I would want to refine your movements and then, you know, you probably are, are quite busy. So I would want to say, well, let's just kind of have these so-called movement snacks, you know, so like, you know, we're sitting for this podcast afterward, you know, it could take a little, you know, two minute walk, you know, I could you know, show you certain stretches. So you're basically creating that pliability because what, you know, if you have the gift of being pliable, you don't want to push your luck too much too, because even though your ligaments and joints can take your ligaments and your muscles might take it, but your joint still feels it. Gotcha. So many women who do yoga, they they're very gifted with that pliability and women are generally on average, more flexible than men. A lot of them need hip replacements and they've never you know picked up a barbell or anything heavy. Why? the joint doesn't actually want to spend so much time in the end range. So if I kept my arm here all day, you can be sure this shoulder is going to degenerate before the other one. But I think that the different camps, they almost create like a, they almost like worship a particular quality. So the strength people worship strength, of course, the yoga people, they worship pliability, but then does the joint actually want that from you long-term? I think it, there's actually some moderation in how you want to pursue the positions and and so for yoga for example there's a a yogi teacher i think his name is bernie clark and he wrote a book called your body your yoga and he had another book called your spine your yoga and it's, it's kind of trying to take that idea is how far you should bend this arm i could safely do it to here for you you probably would feel zero stretch but i'm a kind of like a more of like a stiff type of neurology and stretching feels like torture for me but whereas for you it probably feels like bliss so i think that our neurologies also affect how we um, process it. So I think that there's always, there almost has to be this trust in the process because in the moment, something that feels good can actually be very bad for you if you okay. do it over much long-term. 
Yeah. And I can see the psychology in it because when you're good at something, then you're going to want to do it more and more. And then over time, you'll probably get better at it. And then the better can actually be hazardous for your joints, as you're saying. Yeah. When you see some of those bends, you know, some of those bends, if you did them, you're like, oh, I'll be finished. And then it's almost like we sometimes, I think as Americans and so forth, or, um, or just maybe driven people, you kind of take your type anus into like all these different domains in your life. And then, but then some things in our lives, I feel like are, you know, it wouldn't be sensibly progressed you know so for me that might have been how much weight I would load on myself okay. and you know like certain things and then there's there's actually there's it's great to have moderation and I'm completely inspired by people like Dave Goggins you know you know people who are just pushing their bodies to the absolute limit I'm very inspired by the mentality of that but I do feel like if I told people to do that I, it would be malpractice right you can't just drive people right. with you know into the ground and see who you know, who survives that ordeal. But I would challenge him because I think in one of his books that I read, I think he's hypothyroid or he has like thyroid. He had adrenal off. fatigue. He had oh, yeah, yeah, or adrenal something fatigue. Like that. He almost so died. And then he had to stretch his way out of it. So he had to give his body time to right, recuperate. Right. And then, I mean, it's, I mean, I've read, you know, I think he had the two books he wrote and I love that mentality and the drive. But I think that if you take that mentality into your rehab, you can actually you know, ruin yourself. So I think, yeah, there's times to push and there's arenas to push, but we're, we're all biological structures. We're all, you know, these tissues have finite capacities and then we can overcome them to some degree. But it, I think as, as you pointed out, that comes out in, he, I think he was even overtaxing his endocrine system, which just yeah, went I into totally failure because of that. So then it's kind of like not, it's not healthy, but there's a lot of fun things, kind of crazy things you can do that are actually really inspiring, but, you know, maybe not so good for you. Sure. What are some exercises that would be beneficial for the average person just trying to make sure and maintain their back? And then, you know, how much does diet have to do with, I mean, obviously it redux, reduces inflammation and maybe that's like less pain on the nerve. Yeah. If you can maybe mention some exercises that are beneficial or even maybe posture, just something. Well, you know, so I know now that when I'm working, what's key is some level of movement constantly. And then if there's any other sort of activities and then, and then diet. Oh yeah. So then the, some of the exercises, the ones that professor McGill found in the biomechanics lab that for an average person with no special knee, spine, other injury, it's called the McGill big three. And that's mm -hmm. comprised of three exercises that have kind of the best bang for your buck in terms of the benefit you're going to get and versus the risk of you injuring yourself from doing them. So then the three exercises are known as the bird dog, the side plank, and the modified curl. And mm -hmm. what these exercises all have in common is they're all so-called isometric exercises. It's not like a crunch where you're moving repeatedly. What you're doing instead is it's kind of like a, it's plankish in that you're assuming some sort of challenging position. And then once you assume that position, you're just holding it for a certain amount of time. So then those are on average, the three best exercises to build up um, spine endurance okay. and also um, uh, stiffness. Because when you exercise and each of those exercises challenges a different part of your torso. So we often think of the back as you know, understandably being in the back, but the support structure around it, it's 360. So right. we want the bird dog will support the, the back area, the spinal extensors, the side plank, the sides, and then the modified curl, the front. Another great exercise is a, uh, for the average person is the um, bench push-up. So that's sort of like a plank to begin with. And then you can do some push-ups. And I find that for the level of athleticism the average person is at, that's much more manageable and healthy than doing a push-up on the floor. And also somewhat less uh, restrained. The TRX low row is great because you can actually get a pull exercise that doesn't actually kind of create too much of a pulling stress on the spine, the way it's positioned. I would say those are kind of five great exercises. What was the other part of your question? I, and then the diet. And I, and I know the specific exercises with graphics are in your book, but I mean, I was just- Oh yes, about. yes. And then I could send you the link. So if you, feel, if you want to post any of those graphics in this, in, you know, okay. in the eventual things, well, we can share those. I'm happy to share any of those. And then the, uh, the diet, diet, I think- it, for most mechanical injuries, it's sensible to eat a good diet. One is for weight control. Okay. And then the other is your body is using that nutrients substrate to rebuild your back. So then if you have a horrible nutrition, if you smoke, then you're going to impair the healing process. So I would find, I think it's a, for most people's injuries, it's sort of like, it's an important thing, but it's not 
you're not going to necessarily eat your way to your back healing, but then you're going to support that healing process once you get the right mechanical aspect and the right exercise. With everything you've learned from McGill, the diet, and let's say someone's eating a pretty clean diet, are there, is there anyone that can't actually heal and they would require surgery? I mean, assuming that they're not that far gone in their injury, but are there instances where, you know, if people are microdosing, making sure that they're healthier against their back, they're not overly doing exercises that are negative to the back. Are there certain cases where it's just, yeah, I'm sorry, you need to do surgery or other? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. We, um, I think one of the things I, what I pride myself on most is really just getting to the, the actual cause. And there are some causes where it's malpractice, it's catastrophic to not refer your patient to surgery. I'll give you uh, one example is there is a condition called cauda equina syndrome. It's, it's about 2% of dysbulges. And these dysbulges get so big that it pushes on the spinal nerves in the low back. These spinal nerves feed not just your legs and your glutes, it also feeds your pelvis and your bowel. So some people with these conditions can develop loss of bladder control, okay. loss of bowel control, loose rectal tone. And what happens is if that develops acutely, you have a small window to keep it from progressing catastrophically. So if it progresses catastrophically, the thing that is most scary isn't even the pain, which is already can be quite extraordinary, is that the person may you know, require diapers for life, they may need to self catheterize because their urine, their bladder can't release the urine. And so in some of these cases, we've diagnosed, you know, in the past couple of years, we've diagnosed two or three of these cases. And these are sadly patients who've seen other doctors, and the doctor didn't necessarily realize it. And, and to be fair, sometimes these conditions are quite subtle, I'm just saying the most common symptoms, a lot of times, the symptoms are much more subtle than that. I have to strain when I go to the bathroom. There's two weeks I, I couldn't get an erection. So those are all kind of things that people wouldn't necessarily tie to their back. Okay. And so in those situations, okay. No, yes. There are some conditions where surgery is the only sensible and safe option. And to talk about even, or even to give the exercise is just some completely wrong and unnecessary. So I think that's such a key point is there are conditions where you absolutely need surgery, but any surgery you get you want to make sure you have a clinical diagnosis. You don't want the surgeon just operating on what is um, the ugliest. To give another brief example, there's a patient who saw two prominent LA spine surgeons. One said, oh, get a decompression of your L4, L5 disc bulge. Another said, oh, we need to replace the whole disc. And when I evaluated her, first the MRI, the disc bulge was so small, I couldn't even imagine why they would you know, want to intervene on that area this lady had burning pain down her glute and both legs. She had on the MRI, you could see eight large cysts in her sacral spine. They're called tarlop cysts. And I said, there's no way that those surgeries are appropriate. So she ended up getting surgery on her tarlop cysts. You know, with my guidance, I referred her to a specialist in that zone. And it took her about six months for that pain to wind down, which proved that that was the real pain generator. But I thought, oh, because there's some tarlop cysts that are pain-free, there's a risk that some doctors just assume, but the only way you could know that the tarlop cysts were her pain generator is because of the clinical history she told me and because of the, there were some tells on the physical examination sign. Okay, no, that totally makes sense. What about sleep? So, you know, I hear all things of sleep on your side, sleep on your stomach, sleep on your back. Uh, what is good for, I mean, it's a, the longest period we're in sort of the same position. What do you recommend yes. for sleep? The sleep, you first have to subcategorize the type of pain trigger you are. So let's just use the extension flexion. So let's say I'm someone who, when I get tall, I get pain. Okay. That person will usually struggle with laying on their stomach because when you lay on your stomach, it kind of flattens everything out and you're kind of in that long posture. That person will typically do better on their side or their back because when you're on your back, there's kind of like a little bit of a, a lumbar curve and you actually flatten out a little bit. and you sometimes you don't want it to flatten out too much. You want to give yourself some sort of lumbar support. But the way I would say most generally is the position that you do best with standing, you're trying to just use props and supports to recreate those kind of things. Because for some people, bending their neck is a, a trigger for their back pain. So, but then you see how they lay down and then they're kind of rounded and crooked down. So you're trying to create that sweet spot with all the props because our muscles are turned off when we sleep. 
The side can often be good too, but if you do side sleeping, then you have to think about multiple areas. First, you got to think about the size of your pillow, because if you switch from the back to the front, you see there's a ton of space between my shoulder and my head. I would need to account for all the space or I'm going to wring my neck, or if it's too big, I'm going to push it the other way. So then you want to support the head. You want to create something where usually for your arms, because if you're on your side and then you're going to get some sort of twist, you usually want to support the knees as well. Otherwise, your pelvis is going to twist. And depending on your shape, you might have to support the side of your spine here because then otherwise you could be, if this is the bed, I would kind of bend to the other way. So it's really about kind of tuning it. So some people, they're very curvy. They need, you know, more support or like a thicker support. Some people, they're actually, for me, I'm kind of more of like a flat profile. So if I put too much support, it's going to arch me and make me uncomfortable. So it's just kind of giving, tuning each of those to the, the right degree. Okay. So basically try to mimic the way you should naturally stand. And then wherever you need that support in whatever position you're sleeping, is yes. more of the right answer rather than just that you should be on your back or you should be on your side. Correct. Yeah. There shouldn't be a universal prescription on that. So if I'm flexion intolerant, you know, like meaning I can't bend forward, I might feel really good just laying on my stomach if I don't have, because some people can actually have both, like they could be intolerant to both directions. And in those are where you have a finer window to work through, but that's kind of the rationale is you're, you're taking, I think you understand the central concept. You're taking your pain triggers and you're, you're trying to tune your posture movements and your support so that you're not going into your trigger. And that, to me, the big clue is if I wake up, my worst pain is in the morning, it kind of winds down. For those people, if that's their main pain pattern, if you fix their sleep position, you can often, that's more than half the battle sometimes. I have a question. So in functional medicine, they sometimes will say if you have chronic low back pain, it could be a sign of adrenal dysfunction. Um, you know, sometimes like even with environmental illness, it could be that some of the signs. So other than I'm guessing an MRI, but how do you differentiate that it's not truly like a back injury versus some other thing that's causing stress on your back? Or is it kind of the same? Oh, no, they're, they're quite distinct. I would say, I mean, there could be overlap, but I would actually hasten to say that MRI won't tell you the answer in that case. So this is, these are some of the clues. Usually if it's an adrenal Relate. Let's just say you have an adrenal pain, your spine is 100% fine. Adrenals are over the kidneys. The kidneys are in the upper part of the low back. So it's kind of like what they call that flank area. That So kind of like about, I'm just going to stand up. For, yeah. So about this kind of area, okay. that's, that's your flank area. So usually if you feel pain on both flanks, there's kind of like this Tension. uncomfortable swelling feeling. So that could be a adrenal or a kidney type pain. But then there, of course, are certain spine conditions. Some some types of sciatica can cause that too. So I think the clue there sometimes is, what does the physical exam show? Are disc type maneuvers provoking that pain? And if you can't, and if it's mostly, oh, it's actually when I lay down, when I get up in the morning, that points you towards that as the diagnosis. And the other thing to point out about the adrenals is your cortisol levels will influence kind of your likelihood of developing chronic pain and your ability to heal from different injuries. So on average, if you, let's say, have just a pure back problem that's agonizing, your cortisol levels will generally be higher because you're under constant stress and you're kind of constantly releasing cortisol. But let's say you have some underlying condition, you're overtraining, you have serous, you have some other condition, then you might be adrenal fatigued. So what they find is that if you have a trauma patient, let's say they get in a car crash and they're already low cortisol and they can't create that cortisol spike, those people are much more likely to become chronic pain patients. They're going to have more pain at discharge. They're going to have more pain several months out. So the cortisol response is kind of, it could be a reflection of injury, right? It could be high in some patients, or if it's suppressed, it can actually generate chronic pain issues too. So the likelihood of just getting injured for longer if your cortisol is low. Yes, if your, if your cortisol is chronically suppressed, that's going to uh, affect your ability to heal. Okay. It's going to make it more likely to develop chronic pain. And it's probably going to somehow affect your brain too, independent of any pain process. And so there's, yeah, so it really ties um, the, the HPA, you know, the hypothalamic pituitary axis pathway. It's kind of like, it could be a symptom or a cause. And then the dysfunction of that has a lot of um, consequences. Okay. So from a back pain doctor, it sounds like based on your physical with the patient, you'll know if it's a true spinal disc injury or pain versus like it's an adrenal function 
because of just the yeah. physical things you'll have them try. Yes. So then what, what um, clinicians are doing when they're evaluating is you're looking for patterns. So mm -hmm. here's a disc pattern. Okay. They bend their spine. Oh, that's my usual pain doc. You lift their leg and stress out their sciatic nerve. Oh, that's my pain again. These are all things that don't really stress your adrenals. So it's mm -hmm. causing, but then what if the, this is a different profile? This would be a, more like a serious patient, an adrenal patient. Oh, when I eat gluten, it hurts. I could do sit-ups. I can do all these other things. No problem. And then uh, when my adrenals hurt, I get all these other symptoms too. I get more fatigued. So usually back pain, I mean, it can wear you down and cause you fatigue, but it doesn't have that sudden burst of fatigue. And so you're kind of using those. And, and then it's, I mean, these are such high level questions because it, in honesty, I don't think most clinicians are even thinking to this level or assessing to that level. They're struggling to even identify adrenal fatigue. They're struggling to identify physical injury at a precise level. So I think the fact that you're already thinking about merging the two is, you know, that's like a, a high level topic. And actually before this podcast, I, I was looking at that. It's like, what are, what's the literature I could find about the uh, presentation of adrenal related back pain? I, in my preliminary search, I couldn't find anything. And I'm not surprised because it's such a high level thought process that I think most clinicians aren't even, it's a clinical diagnosis anyway. So most people wouldn't make that leap. Okay. That's fascinating. Where should people get started if they're starting to have back pain? You know, should they start incorporating the McGill method? Should they go see you? Like what is the best thing to start? And obviously movement is huge as you're saying yes. without too much I've stress or burden. Yeah. So I have a, I have kind of like a, maybe a little bit unique philosophy. I, I love all the patient empowerment stuff, but I think you got a big problem. Go find the best clinician you can. Um, the McGill um, clinicians are on backfitpro.com. So they're, of course, they're welcome to consult with me or one of these other providers. And of course, there's other communities that treat back pain well for kind of select different issues, but I'm just not as familiar with their work, but Backfit Pro is a great resource to start on. I think your goal if you have chronic back pain is you want a precise diagnosis, whether you could fix it with mechanics or not. You just want to know what you have because that guides every other decision, surgery, no surgery, the type of rehab program. And one of my patients told me he went to one place for physical therapy, got a printout of disc exercises that some of which hurt him. Then he went to a different exercise and he saw the same printout. He's like, this is the exact same thing I did. So then it's kind of like, they're not you, you don't want to go to someone who's using a cookie cutter approach because your health, your body, your spine injury, it's completely unique. You tell me, Hey, I got two patients with a five millimeter L4, L5 disc bulge. I don't, I don't, I haven't begun to understand the patient. There's at least eight injury mechanisms, some of which that could occur simultaneously that could be happening. You need to find somebody who's thinking about your injury mechanisms, pain triggers, who can coach you or refer you to somebody who using that knowledge is going to coach you. And you need to see somebody who, if they see a red flag, they'll tell you it's a red flag. They're not going to try to exercise, train your kata equine a patient. So I think you really need somebody who kind of, they don't have to know how to do surgery. They don't have to know how to do everything. Of course, none of us do, but you have to have that baseline understanding. And that comes, all you really need is a room and exam table, you know, and, and a clinician who has the time and expertise. That's really what you should be looking for. I think it would be hard. So if I want, because I'm just trying to think of it as if I went in, I have back pain, I do an MRI, the doctor says, Oh, based on your MRI, you have blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, well, I, because I'm not an expert in back pain, I may think, okay, the doctor knows that I'm assuming based on my symptoms, plus the MRI, he's making a good diagnosis, but it sounds like often they're really just going off the MRI and saying checkbox or not. And that's concerning because I don't know what I don't know as a patient. Yes. Yeah. It's not your job to know what you don't know. I mean, I, I think you have to empower yourself to work with clinicians who are thinking. So let's just talk about one mechanism of, of disc back pain. My disc herniated, it's pushing on a spinal nerve. I feel pain shooting down my right leg. So that's one type of mechanism. Sure. But then even amongst that type of disc bulge mechanism, depending on where the disc is in your spinal canal, that can change your treatment program. So if it's, if it's more in the middle, that's one kind of treatment program. If it's more off to the side, you're more likely to get injured by extension. So I think that's actually one of the most common is if it's off to the side, the so-called neural foraminal stenosis, the extension actually makes that neural foramen even smaller. And so they're actually unwittingly pinching their nerves all day. So there's a lot of this, these fine details 
that you actually have to know, you have to know, well, where's the bulge? Where is it pushing? And also you have to know things that you can't see on the MRI is their instability. I'll push a patient from the side, keeping them tall. Some of them will have no pain. Some of them, that will be a big pain trigger. There, you can't see most of the instability on the MRI. It's a clinical diagnosis. I find it scary because you look up on Google and you look up back pain exercises and now it's just, it's so nuanced and it makes sense because I mean, even in the diet space, there's so much nuance, but it's just crazy that we think back pain equals one solution and just talking to you, it's obvious that it's not. And it has to be just like in diet, we think of bio-individuality with the macros, the calories, the the amount of protein, how many meals and all of that. It's just also nuanced with the back. But I think most people, including myself, thought there are certain exercises, you know, walking is or standing is better than sitting, uh, laying down on your, I think it was side that I used to always hear is the better way to lay and maybe you get a body pillow. And it's just, it's so nuanced. And I think most people don't know. And I think that's why your content of what you're sharing as a pain doctor and a back doctor expert is so invaluable. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think that's kind of, I'm so privileged to be a clinician because I know we've had private conversations about it. As a clinician, you can have any theory you want, but when rubber meets the road, yes. are you able to even explain the person's symptoms with the mental model you have? I think many people can't. Like some, many people can't even answer the question, why is my disc bulge only hurt in my back? It doesn't hurt my leg at all. I don't have sciatica, right? Like I think most people get even stuck on that stuff, but then there's a range of clinical kind of things and having you know been this person who just mostly prescribed painkillers and wanted a better way having learned the McGill method and practiced kind of this biomechanical psychologically you know centered approach you can see it's it's astounding it's I can't always take someone's pain away you know right away but what I can do is I can often make them hurt a lot more by messing with their posture so that kind of proves that posture is a modulator right. to some extent in, in their condition. So yeah, so thank you. I, I think your, your questions were amazingly high level. And yeah, this is a very, very insightful. And I would just lastly say that just like you say, you know, vitamin D, vitamin C, B12, those are essential nutrients. So too is movement and loading. Those are essential things. And there's a sweet spot that each of us needs for it to kind of have a particular version of health or a particular adaptation to deal with a particular kind of set of physical stresses. Well, thank you so much for your time. You know, where can people find your book? Where can people find to work with you, especially if they're having chronic back pain? I feel, I feel that a lot of carnivores, as they eat this way, they reduce their inflammation. You'll see their CRP marker go down. Um, and, and then they'll say, oh my gosh, my back pain is better. And then you'll see them eat gluten and it's probably related to the adrenals. But if people are still having chronic back pain, um, even if they're eating a clean diet, you know, where can they find you, your clinic and your book? Our clinic, uh, we, our uh, website is masterymedical.com. Where I'm also kind of in the process of building a spine blog called specificspine.com, which is the same name of the um, as the book Specific Spine. And I'm currently setting up all that Amazon stuff. So it'll, it should be on Amazon. It should be on our um, either of those websites. Okay. And I'll put everything in the show notes. Well, thank you so much for your time. This was so insightful. I've learned so much. My brother struggles with chronic back pain. So I'm going to absolutely have him watch this because it's always been something about the disc and I never realized maybe he's just doing incorrect movements. And I think that's hopeful because he's done everything you've talked about, like the injections right now, he's at the stage of people are saying you need to do surgery. And I just, um, I just don't know if that's the right answer. So yeah, that may or may not be the answer. I would say over 75% of the time you can avoid the surgery. So it's only, it's less than 25% of the time that the person actually needs the surgery. Once they kind of undergo the, they give their spine more favorable conditions to heal. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time again. Hey, thank you for yours. Okay, guys, I hope you enjoyed this interview. It was so fascinating to learn about how when we think that posture of putting our shoulders back and standing straight is the best posture and good for our spine, and it actually isn't. Um, it's interesting to learn that wearing heels, which I kind of already knew that, but sucking in is actually really bad for your spine and how most back pain really truly stems from a lot of the disc injury. And it makes a lot of sense, especially when Dr. Jim was touching that eraser and I'll probably never look at an eraser the same way. If you are suffering from chronic back pain, consider getting the book and thinking about some of the exercises or the four major exercises that Dr. Jim mentioned to start healing your back pain. 
diet is so important in reducing overall inflammation and having nerve pain just be more reduced, especially if there's just general inflammation in the body. If you're eating a mostly carnivore diet or meat based diet, and your back pain is still not improving enough, I highly recommend looking into the exercises to try to improve and get to root cause healing with your back pain. So as Dr. Jim says, it looks like you can improve your back pain, but there's just little techniques and nuances and bio individuality that you may need to care for to make sure that your back will never go out on you again. Okay, guys, make sure to eat a lot of meat. Take care of your backs because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you later. Bye guys.